Hey there, my name's Johnny, and welcome to this tutorial thing on camera stuff. It's a horrible name. Introduction to basic camera stuff? An introduction to basic camera settings and how to use that thing you're holding. As long as it's a camera. Throughout this video, I'll be covering a few basic things what they do, and how you can utilize them while shooting. Uh, I'll also be posting more videos later that go more in depth with each one of these things that we go over in this video, and you'll be able to watch those too. Over the course of this video, I'll be covering the exposure triangle, as well as some guidelines to remember while you're out shooting. But always remember that these are only guidelines, and with photography or any other type of art, Guidelines can and should be broken, but you kind of have to know what the guidelines are in the first place to be able to properly break them. I'll also be covering a few tips and tricks that I would suggest maybe noting down either physically or mentally, whichever one works better for you. I'm one of those people that can't write shit down because then I end up drawing little sketches of like Samuel L. Jackson riding a dirt bike down a giraffe's neck or something. I mean, it's really bad. Like seriously, look at this. It's horrible. Like, I'm horrible at doodling. I try. Sometimes I can work something out that looks nice. It's not very often, though. The couple tips that I'm going over might not make sense to you right away, but after you finish watching this video, get out and start shooting and editing. The more you start doing that, it'll sort of all come together and make a little bit more sense for you. I'll also be showing some examples actually utilizing each piece of the exposure triangle. And provided that I'm not a completely horrible teacher, you'll walk away from this video a little bit more knowledgeable about how to use your camera. Before I begin with everything else, a quick side note about shooting in RAW as an image format. It's not a must, but a really good idea to be shooting in RAW for best results with post-processing. RAW is a flat image format, which saves and retains the entirety of data in a captured image, opening huge windows for post-processing in programs such as Lightroom and Photoshop. For this tutorial, I would suggest to make sure that you're either shooting in RAW format or at least RAW plus JPEG. These options can be found in your camera's menu. Let's start with the exposure triangle then. So what is the exposure triangle? Simply put, the exposure triangle lays out for us the three fundamental elements of exposure. Aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. A combination of these three elements make up a value known as an exposure value or EV. Let's begin by talking a bit about aperture. Aperture is the value noted in the form of f-stops on your camera. These values represent a measure of how open or closed the lens's iris is. Aperture is controlled by the shifting and opening or closing of very little, very thin blades inside your attached lens. Thanks to the optic system, this is where shit can get confusing. When we refer to the smallest number, we're actually referring to the largest aperture. And when we refer to the largest number, we're actually referring to the smallest aperture. So what do these numbers mean and what do they do for our photos? They control a couple things. Amount of light being let onto the camera sensor and depth of field, which means how much is in or out of focus in our image. For example, a very large aperture, such as 1.4, will give a specific subject the spotlight of the shot, blurring the backdrop into a big shitty mess. This is a good thing when you wish to give an image that soft, whimsical feel, or when shooting portraits, so when your drunk friend is embarrassing himself in the background while you're trying to take a photo of your family at a birthday party, you won't even notice that he's projectile vomiting into the fish pond. That saves you an explanation to not only your grandma on Facebook, but PETA as well. With a larger opening, you'll let more light into the camera, simply because the opening is, well, larger. This allows for a faster shutter speed as well. We'll address shutter speed in just a moment. With a smaller opening, we'll be letting much less light into the camera, but expanding our depth of field. Great for landscapes or any other situation where you would want most of the image to have a crisp focus. With a smaller opening, however, we're forced towards a slower shutter speed. You'll notice that as the number grows larger and our aperture grows smaller, more comes into focus. However, to achieve the same exposure, other settings must be adjusted. Now, let's take a quick look at shutter speed. Whenever a camera shutter is open, it's recording reflection of light of anything in the scene to the camera sensor. 
When objects move or the camera moves, this will create a blurred mess of any scene in front of you. This can at times give a really cool effect, but isn't usually what you're going for unless you're working in abstract photography like that. In fact, there's even a specific genre of photography referred to as kinetic photography, where photographs are created by the camera reacting to forces applied in order to create an image from movement of light onto the sensor. This includes long exposure techniques such as zooming in and out with your lens, shaking the camera while taking a photo, dropping the camera, or even tossing the camera up in the air or spinning it. Of course, I wouldn't suggest tossing an expensive piece of equipment up into the air, but I can't say that I haven't done that very thing. Kinetic photography, of course, is not to be confused with light painting or just general long exposures. One of those guidelines I was talking about can be brought into play here. It's been said that you normally wouldn't want to handhold a shot of a slower shutter speed than the current focal length of your lens. For example, if I'm shooting a 50 millimeter lens, I wouldn't want to go any lower than 1 50th of a second. However, as with all of these guidelines, this can be broken with a steady hand. Not steadied with a broken hand. Maybe a broken hand. I don't know. Really, the main thing is you don't want your images to look like you just down an entire thermos of Death Wish coffee. So it's a good idea to grab a tripod for slower exposures, especially night shots or star shots of any kind. Now onto ISO. In lower light situations, there may be times where you don't want to be or can't be carrying a tripod around, nor do you have a chair or garbage can or anything else to use as one. You may also run into situations where you want to capture a fast-moving subject in light that might be more dim. This can happen quite often in street photography and concert photography, just to name a couple situations. These situations are where higher ISO settings can save your shot from being ruined or missed. Though, higher ISO settings are not always desirable and may not always be what you want to use. So let's talk about what ISO is. ISO stands for International Standards Organization, in this case meaning a governing body that sets sensitivity standards for sensors in digital cameras. ISO can be thought of as a sort of digital gain for images. When using actual film, this is referred to as sensitivity, noting how sensitive a certain film is to light. In digital photography, this doesn't really make the sensor more sensitive to light, but if it helps, you can think of it that way. In reality, it actually artificially exposes the scene inside the camera to achieve a brighter lit image. The downside to shooting with a higher ISO is the introduction of more digital noise to your photos. There are times where this isn't desirable and should be avoided though there are also times where it's not so bad and it might be necessary to capture a really important shot. There are also plugins and techniques that can help you reduce noise in certain situations. So how do we put all of these together to take a photograph? When taking a photograph, you want to keep these three things in mind. Think about what you're shooting. Do you want a specific subject to take the spotlight? Are you looking to showcase an entire landscape? How light or dark is your scene? For example, let's say I'd like to photograph a flower. I mean, I'd like to, but all I have is this coloring book of exotic cocks. So it'll have to do. I'd like this coloring book to be the center of attention. So this tells me that I'd want to work with a wide aperture. So something around 1.8 to 2 should be good. In this case, I'm going to use 1.8. Next, I'll take note of my surroundings. How light or how dark is it? The room is somewhat lit, but it's still quite dim through a camera. Since I'm using such a large aperture, this means I can maybe get away with using a very low ISO. In this case, I'll try to use 100 and see what I can achieve. I'll dial this in and take it right down to 100. Since I bumped this down to 100, you can see that the picture on the camera actually got darker. This means that it wants me to adjust my shutter speed. Now, given that I have my scene in proper focus, this is the last thing that I'm going to need to actually take care of. In this case, I focus beforehand, so everything is good. Now I can begin to adjust the shutter speed by using the camera's light meter. The light meter is shown in at least one form of a line similar to what's shown here. You'll see that you have a zero in the middle with negative one and negative two to the left, or plus one and plus two to the right. This is how the camera tells us what it thinks the proper exposure should be for the given scene. In this particular scene, 
with an ISO of 100 and an aperture of 1.8, I was able to reach a shutter speed of 1 13th of a second. This is far too slow to handhold, so I actually made use of a little suitcase and stabilized my camera on there because I only have one tripod and I have this other camera on the tripod. It's another little tip. Make use of your surroundings. If you don't have a tripod or you, know, you weren't able to bring a tripod, it's always good to just set up on something. As long as it keeps your camera still, I mean, you can make a lot of use out of everyday objects. So there we have a photo with the proper exposure and a very shallow depth of field. On this particular camera, the light meter actually reads 0, 1, 2, 3 in both directions. The camera that I'm using here is a Canon Rebel T5i. If I half press on the shutter button, it'll actually give me a light meter reading. You can see a little arrow over here on the positive end, meaning that it wants me to increase my shutter speed faster. I'm going to increase it and half press again. You'll see that a little mark appeared here. And you can see that if we move the shutter speed each way, it'll actually move that little mark. What we aim to get is that little mark right in the middle. So 1 13th of a second being what the camera thinks it should be, it'll sit right in the middle for a proper exposure. Having a blinking arrow on the right means that your camera will want you to increase the shutter speed to a faster speed. Totally opposite, on the other end, if you have too, too fast of a shutter speed and your camera wants you to have a slower shutter speed, it'll give you a blinking arrow on the left, eventually resulting in this little tiny line dot guy moving to the center for a proper exposure. Again, this is where the guidelines come into play that this does not always need to be followed so strictly. There are numerous reasons that you might want to expose differently, which I'll go over in other tutorials. One of those other guidelines that I was saying might not make sense right away, but will make sense over time, always expose for highlights. So what does this mean? It means that you actually want to expose the image for the very brightest part of the scene that you're shooting. Like all guidelines, this can of course be broken, but it's always something to remember. Darker areas and shadows, given that they're not too dark, can be pulled out during post-processing. But once the sensor is saturated with too much light in an area of an image, there's no way you'll be able to recover that data. It becomes blown out and gone forever. This concludes an introductory tutorial on how to use basic camera settings. Be sure to subscribe and comment below for other tutorials and videos that you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.